very warm welcome to everybody watching this evening. I am Samantha Castle, the Senior Manager for Alumni Relations at the University of Pretoria. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to another informative and engaging edition of Lead UP Online Virtual Chats. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, Lead UP Online is a series of virtual panel discussions among our well-renowned UP academic staff and alumni situated in South Africa and across the globe. Each session, we look to address topical issues of public interest that are affecting our society today. We'd love to engage with you over social media, so I encourage you to comment on tonight's session and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We really do appreciate your ongoing support. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, who will be our moderator for this evening. So without further ado, let us kick off tonight's discussion. Please enjoy. A good evening to everyone. Of course, it could be also good morning or good, eve good afternoon, wherever you are sitting as alumni. Welcome to Lead UP in conversation with the VC alumni virtual chat. This event tagline is International Relations Strategies for Strengthening South Africa's Reputation on the Global Stage. Tonight, I'll be chatting to the Honorable Minister, Dr. Nala Dipando, who is a Minister of International Relations and Cooperation and a UP graduate, as well as Dr. Stembile Mbete, a UP graduate and senior lecturer in UP's Political Sciences Department. Of course, the, the event is brought to you by the University of Pretoria and the panelists will be joining our UP associates. So you are all alumni, we are all family. I've introduced our two speakers. Now I would like to indicate to you where you need to put your comments in the chat or use or go to slido.com and using at lead UP 10 March, and then you can put in your comments and questions there. The technical staff will uh, channel the questions to me. Now I'm going to go to our panelists and ask them two questions, ask them a series of questions, and then we'll have a discussion. First questions to you, uh, my very um, honored alumni. I'm proud of both of you as your vice chancellor and principal. I post about you wherever I can. My colleagues, the vice chancellor, struggle to you know, bring up similar alumni of a similar profile. But I just want to know, why did you choose to do your PhDs at UP? I'll start with you, Dr. Naledi Pando. <laughs> Oh, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone who's uh, joining us. Uh, it's evening in South Africa. Well, reason number one uh, was uh, accessibility. The university is located in the capital city uh, of South Africa, uh, de facto, and I work uh, in Pretoria, and I needed uh, an institution uh, that I would be able to access. That was one. But two... It was reputation. The university was recommended to me. Um, I did a lot of research before deciding uh, where uh, uh, to apply uh, to do a, a doctorate. And uh, I spoke to many, many colleagues, and it was intriguing uh, that a lot of them were directing me toward the University of Pretoria, given my area of interest. Uh, I was uh, keen to work in the area of education policy. Uh, and particularly higher education, and uh, several colleagues in the academic sector said to me, there are people at the University of Pretoria who really know what you're talking about, approach that institution. And then the last point was, I had met uh, Professor Jonathan Jansen, who boasted to me about how successful the education faculty of the University of Pretoria is in supporting postgraduate students and supporting them to actually achieve uh, their ambition. Uh, South Africa sometimes has a very uh, low throughput of postgraduate students. 
uh, Jonathan Jansen uh, told me that Pretoria doesn't suffer from that particular negative uh, and that they would provide someone like myself, an adult, a mature uh, a student uh, with support and that I would indeed be able to pursue uh, my postgraduate interests uh, to success. So those are some of my reasons. Yes. Okay, no, thank you very much. So, Dr. Ambete, you also appreciate the investor of Pretoria. Why did you choose the investor of Pretoria? Why didn't you go to VITS, UCT? You are a graduate of UCT for your master's, I remember. Indeed I am. Thank you, Prof Kope, and thank you uh, to everyone uh, who has joined us on this call. So I, uh, similarly, I suppose to the minister, was working in government. I was working in the presidency at the time that I applied for a doctorate at the University of Pretoria. And so part of the uh, rationale was uh, convenience because it would be I would be able to access um, university resources uh, after work but the primary reason was to work with my supervisor uh, Professor Maxi Skuman who at the time was the head of the Department of Political Sciences and is one of the most prolific uh, and well-respected international relations uh, scholars that South Africa has produced and very rarely uh, in South African uh, international relations um, is a woman. Uh, and so I had been reading her work since my undergraduate days at UCT and somebody advised that she would be a great person to work with for my doctoral study, which was um, looking at uh, South Africa's uh, previous two terms in the United Nations Security Council. And so uh, when I approached her, uh, she was very eager uh, to work with me. And then I was became very conscious of all the other benefits of uh, doing a doctorate in international relations in the capital city and also the diplomatic hub of South Africa. So in uh, the time of my doctorate, I had access to every uh, embassy to the United Nations um, office in South Africa itself, to the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, uh, to really be able to have all the resources I need to do uh, my, my PhD. Um, and so it was really the best choice uh, for me. And I'm very glad that it's one that I made. Mm, okay, I understand also your department teaches a course in a master's in diplomatic studies. And there is that center which I still want activated to teach a, a diplomacy. So what, what do you teach to produce uh, South Africa's graduates? And would you say that you have contributed to, you know, providing a well-educated, well-trained, knowledgeable diplomas for our Department of International Relations and Cooperation? I'm asking you first, then I'll ask the minister whether she <laughs> finds people you have trained to be up to what she needs to do her job. Indeed, and I think that our department does this in two ways. So uh, we have the students that join us from undergraduate, the first years, like the ones we were doing orientation with uh, yesterday online, uh, who join us in first year and go through their undergraduate degrees and their honors um, and sometimes right up to master's and, and PhD with us in the department. And the way in which we prepare those students is to not only provide them with the theory theoretical underpinnings um, of international relations and um and, you know, teach them all of the content and the work that they need and to know about the United Nations and the African Union um, and, and the principles of diplomacy. But what we also do is through the events that we host as a department, um, really provide students with direct access to diplomats that are already working in the field. And so uh, our department, because it has such close relations with the diplomatic community in Pretoria, um, many of our students are able to do internships, to uh, have travel opportunities with um, 
the diplomatic community in Pretoria. And so they get kind of a practical experience uh, while they are studying, uh, which is hugely beneficial to them and really helps them to be able to understand the world of diplomacy in practice, not just in theory, while they are students. And I think that means that we uh, have very capable students that then go out into the job market. And then the second way that the universe, that our department contributes to the training of diplomats is by um, professionals that are already in the system, that are working in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, but also in other international relations units in other departments uh, within our government, and that we provide them with professional training to really um, polish uh, the skills that they already have and to enhance their abilities uh, to work as diplomats representing the South African government. But what we also have is that we have a number of our uh, postgraduate students that are diplomats that are working for other countries that choose to do their master's degrees at the University of Pretoria while they are posted in South Africa because the qualification is a well-respected one internationally uh, and they feel um, that we really provide them uh, with an expertise and with polish that they otherwise uh, would not have. So I think that both with existing professionals and with our new students, uh, we provide, we have contributed, uh, I think, to uh, this diplomatic sector, not just in South Africa, but internationally. Thank okay. you. So Minister, of course, I mean, it's not the investor of Pretoria. I would love it if it was a monopoly that I, my university only trained all diplomats, <laughs> but they're trained elsewhere in South Africa's 26 public universities. How do you find the quality in general of our training in South Africa's public universities? Uh, of diplomas that you need for to do the job that you do? Um, well, I, I have found that uh, we have many very talented young people in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation who've attended uh, the various universities uh, in our country. I, I just want to return to the earlier question in replying to you and say yeah. that uh, I think one of the... Uh, characteristics that a diplomat would have to have is both an understanding of the present, but also an appreciation of the past, because this yeah. shapes South Africa, and they must understand that as diplomats, they represent our country. And I think yeah. uh, being at the University of Pretoria, you're immersed uh, both in the past, in the present, and in the future, because it's a university remaking itself from uh, uh, our experience uh, of apartheid and apartheid higher education. Uh, so um, the institution can help us uh, in shaping a diplomat who has a diverse set of very unique qualities. Not many countries uh, uh, want you educated on your history uh, in order to reflect who and what your country is. And I think uh, the University of Pretoria provides this in its international uh, relations program, as I've been told uh, by many young people. I also am aware uh, that the university, uh, from my engagement with past leaders of the institution, is very committed to multidisciplinarity. And this is very, very vital. Uh, our diplomats have to speak science, economics, uh, humanities, politics. So they can't be, cannot be narrow uh, in their training. Uh, they have to come in with a broad uh, uh, understanding of a wide range of uh, intellectual matters. Finally, um, the worst form of training for a diplomat would be in a uni university with a very hegemonic uh, character where you don't have a cosmopolitan presence of academics and students. And I think the university offers this attribute of an inclusion of academics and students uh, from many different parts of the world. And then that mix, it being a diplomatic capital, uh, is very, very important because um, we can suffer at times from insularity. 
uh, and imagine uh, uh, that we should base our opinions and interaction on our sense of self. But I think when you have the opportunity to experience beyond yourself, you build a very valuable uh, set of characteristics which allow you then uh, to be able to really make the world your place. And I think uh, the university, and I must say other universities as well, not just Pretoria, uh, several South African universities do offer very good international relations programs. Uh, but given that we're close to UP, uh, we are in our own diplomatic academy, do have very strong partnerships with the university and uh, its various uh, departments. And we utilize that strength to help improve our own uh, uh, training of nominees who will be posted abroad. So let's just say we are the premier diplomatic training university, <laughs> but others do other training too. <laughs> so let me move towards the sort of the focus of the question around strategies for positioning South Africa on the global stage. The one thing I post about everywhere in the world, and my friends ask me, it's just a name of the of of the of the ministry, Department of International Relations and Cooperation, not Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of External Relations, like I see in other countries. Now, I think uh, I've been asked to explain this, and I never bothered to ask any minister. I decided to explain it on my own. I said it was a progressive move. Foreign affairs is very, very strange. What do you mean by foreign? but international relations and cooperation connotes something that also means multilateralism, pursuing a good goal in the public interest. Now, today I have a chance to get corrected. Was I right in saying so? And how, that, how is this expressed in the actual practice of our relating to other countries on the globe, including countries on our continent? Thank you very much for that. I think in the practice of uh, building international collaboration and partnerships, uh, the government realized that the practice of diplomacy is very, very broad, much more uh, than what we may make of it, and that uh, we're both building uh, friendships, but also building partnerships. We're seeking to assist us uh, in addressing our own unique challenges, but also uh, building the ability to help others address their own. So we cooperate internationally and also ensure that we build friendly relations. So it's a broader set of demands uh, that would have to be uh, responded to by the department. So bilateral interests are very, very important. But the bilateral without the multilateral uh, would be a problem. Uh, the friendship without economic diplomacy won't assist South Africa in its economic objectives. Um, the uh, north-south without the south-south is immaterial. So really it was to have a, a sense of uh, ensuring uh, that there is a, a name uh, that gives credence to the uh, complex and broad aspect of the work uh, that this department has to undertake. One day I may be having a friendly conversation uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister in Turkmenistan. On another day, I'm speaking to a colleague uh, just next door and we talk the same language. Uh, so the issues we might address are very different. And then on a third day, I'm trying to assist uh, a, a potential South African investor in another country to overcome barriers that she has come across in that country. So it's very much a very wide reach of uh, 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 tasks uh, that this ministry uh, has to address. Yeah. So, Stembile, do you think now as a, as a political analyst and a scholar of, <laughs> of international relations, do you think the intention behind the name, International Relations and Cooperation, has actually been realized? Well, that's a tough uh, question. I think that certainly what you can't uh, get away from 
is the international context, the global context within which South Africa operates. And in many ways, it is one uh, of conflict, uh, of competition, uh, and of decisions being made in a national interests or in particular state interests um, and not for uh, the global good or for or for co-op or for the reasons um, of cooperation. And so for a country like South Africa to pursue that kind of uh, cooperative engagement internationally is immensely difficult uh, because international relations are still uh, governed in many ways by power um, dynamics and by a strategic interest. And so I think that while uh, that has been the goal uh, that South Africa has pursued, it is often not as successful in its results um, as uh, the minister and diplomat would, would like it to be. I think a particular case in point at the moment is uh, the world um, South Africa and India have uh, May put it through an application for a waiver, an international, an intellectual property waiver uh, on COVID nineteen um, medicines uh, and equipment in order to make those a public good that can be used uh, equally across the world uh, for all countries to be able to address uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic. And that uh, application is being opposed by the European Union, by Japan, um, and a group of pharmaceutical companies uh, today have written a letter to the US President uh, Joe Biden to urge him, his administration, to continue opposing uh, that application. And so, um, you know, I think that that's just an experience an example of the kind of environment that South Africa has to operate in. And so uh, there's a mixed record, really, of success um, in terms of uh, pursuing the kind of foreign policy uh, that the minister has outlined. So, 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 but what you are saying is that it is not for South Africa's lack of trying. It is for, for other, because for, you can try and your intention can be good. But the counter uh, uh, effect from others might actually dent your own aim. But our, you, you agree that our foreign, uh, no, no, I don't like the word foreign policy. Our international relations intent is good and would promote multilateralism if successful. Minister, I. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, Senator. I would say that it is usually good, but of course, South Africa is a state like other states. And we have situations where we are driven by those state interests rather than um, our better uh, inclinations uh, and, and, and ideals. And so we have also seen South Africa engage uh, internationally in security situations, sometimes on the mat multi in multilateral uh, forums, in a way that is just like other states to protect um, its own interests. And so um, I think that often, and I know you don't like the word uh, foreign policy, but I think uh, often the stated foreign policy um, of states is about their uh, their better selves, their, their their highest ideals, but in diplomatic practice. Um, that often falls short. And I think that South Africa isn't any different uh, to other states um, in that respect. Yeah. Okay. Minister, do you want to respond to that? Then there's a question from Bushi about does JECO get involved in addressing violence against foreign nationals? And are there mm. any public awareness programs? Um, well, let me uh, say that uh, uh, Dr. Mbete is right. Um, we are, you know, perhaps comparable to other countries, uh, but I would believe we are different. South Africa has not gone to war against any country. We have not practiced uh, any negative, uh, 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 you know, with respect to ethnic cleansing led by the state, etc. In fact, it's something we are bore as government. Uh, and uh, we have tried in international fora to uphold uh, uh, respect uh, for multilateralism and uh, for uh, human rights, uh, democracy, and good governance. 
We've not succeeded uh, on all accounts, and it would be implausible to imagine that we would. Uh, we are not a sort of Leviathan, you know, that has all sorts of, of power as yet. And I think uh, we are working hard to ensure that we do build a stronger African consensus on a range of issues so that we can bring a far stronger lobby than we're often able to bring into the global stage. On this uh, WTO temporary waiver, I think the temporary is important. Um, we have managed to persuade all African countries to support uh, the application uh, brought by India and South Africa. And there are over 100 countries that are supporting this call for a temporary waiver in the context of the fight against COVID-19. So I think it's an important moment, uh, both for the WTO and for the world. And it would be great if civil society could also marshal behind this call, because it cannot be that we are not allowed access to productive capacity for those treatments that will help us to combat uh, this disease. The fact of not having this ability renders less able, renders us less able to respond to the pandemic. So I think it's a very important call. Uh, and even if we do not succeed, the fact that it's on the table, that we are debating it, and that it is the wealthy countries that are objecting is a very important signal to the world. And South Africa must continue. I mentioned it to the EU ambassadors yesterday. I continue to argue for this. And I think we must just pursue uh, this battle. I do think the matter of pharmaceutical companies and their weight and control over access to treatments and diagnostics is really something we as activists must give greater attention to. So indeed, yes, there are failings, uh, um, you know, but sometimes it's also a matter of strategy. It's a matter of the time. It's a matter of where you are uh, because diplomacy is not a static one line uh, matter uh, that, you know, there is this issue, you can respond to it in this way. As Dr. Mbete is saying, there may be issues of national interest. It might be 4,000 jobs versus a signature on a particular document. Uh, so, you know, you have to consider all that. And sometimes you weigh it up and you say, no, I don't care, sorry. And other times you say, no, no, uh, actually, this won't lose us anything. I can't give you the particular instances, uh, but they do arise. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so now to the subject of your PhD, Dr. Mbete, and the Minister, the matter of the Security Council. So we have had a number of students there. We just came off the Security Council. By the way, also last night when I was just channel surfing, I bumped on the president talking at one of those 75th anniversaries. And he said that multilateralism has been weakened, and I caught him. He says that it needs to be emboldened. But I didn't realize they were still doing the 75-year anniversaries. Because Minister and I, uh, as you remember, Stambile, we, we were in a panel last year to do that. So I was a little surprised and thought my TV had rewinded to last year. But anyway, he made very a number of strong statements around weakening of multilateralism, needing it to be strengthened. Second, he spoke about vaccine nationalism and a number of those things. But my question really is around uh, what have we achieved in our stints when we've been in the Security Council, we just came off now. And also, I presume we are part of the lobby too, to you know, democratize or expand the Security Council. If, for example, that happened and the rest of the continent said, South Africa represent us in the security, expanded Security Council, what would we achieve by being in that body? Well, I, I hope South Africa would lead in its democratization because uh, I'm not absolutely certain uh, that having a body of small uh, number of uh, member states uh, of the United Nations is the most appropriate uh, mechanism of, of uh, global governance. Um, uh, so I, I believe that in the discussions about reform of the United Nations, we need to broaden beyond permanent membership of the Security Council. 
and actually look at matters of where are the final decisions made, uh, which decisions might be forwarded from that smaller body into the General Assembly for voting by the broader membership and so on. So there are, there are larger uh, uh, questions. Uh, but certainly, uh, while the uh, uh, Security Council uh, is uh, composed as it is, we do believe that uh, there should be more uh, permanent members and that the world has altered from 1947 uh, and that we, we have to take, you know, have cognizance of Asia in particular and Africa and Latin America and that the composition uh, of uh, the uh, Security Council must be altered uh, visibly. We would take our agenda, uh, which is one of uh, focusing on development, uh, addressing uh, issues of poverty and uh, inequality, uh, which mar, in particular, the African continent as key issues that we would uh, uh, you know, take into uh, that particular uh, forum. Um, I also uh, believe that uh, there's been resistance to full discussion on reform uh, because uh, certain uh, regions of the world and countries have old enmities which uh, enter into the fray as Africa tries to advance a uh, progressive uh, deliberation on reform of the United Nations. We've got to insist and continue to argue that we want detailed deliberations, text based on reform of the UN uh, mechanisms, because I think that will be the only way that we're going to see uh, progress. On the matter of uh, uh, the fight uh, against abuse uh, and violence uh, against uh, uh, foreign nationals in our country, as uh, Durka, we have been very clear and categorical that this is a disgraceful uh, part of a character uh, that we have uh, in some uh, parts of our community, in our country. And it's uh, a criminal, we think, matter. But we also have to educate as South Africans, our people, to learn to be more accepting of others uh, and less uh, uh, fearful and, and angry uh, toward those who come into our country seeking refuge and assistance uh, from South Africa and South Africans. So I think uh, we need to do more popular or civic education. We try to do so uh, in a, a really a, not a very robust manner. Uh, it's something that I think uh, we need to consider uh, more deeply. We have diplomatic fairs where uh, our embassies open up to the broader community, but I think we should have more outreach. Uh, we are working on such uh, strategies, more civic education in partnership with non-governmental organizations uh, working in the sector. I also believe that uh, what we need to do using uh, uh, universities and research institutions is to have a deeper understanding of what is it that makes some South African communities so negative? What, what is the actual underlying uh, reason? Uh, because we treat it you know, sometimes in a cavalier fashion uh, and we tend to look at the incidents rather than to probe the underlying causes and how they might be addressed and how indeed we could build uh, uh, greater uh, uh, alliances between uh, Africans uh, in South Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if you're on CNN, they would have that banner that calls S S S UN Security Council expect an analyst. So as the expect and analyst, can you say what is South Africa's achievement in those things in the Security Council? And, and also your views on Security Council and UN reform in general. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Prof, for, for that question. So, 
Firstly, I think that we must never forget, and, and, and the minister uh, alluded to it, that the UN Security Council represents the balance of global power at the end of the Second World War, 1945. The five permanent members of the Security Council were, in effect, the winners uh, of the Second World War and were able to shape the post-Second World War uh, world order and did that through their permanent membership of the Security Council and their veto power. And I always argue, and I argue this in my PhD, that the real power of the permanent five members of the Security Council is their permanence more than it is the veto. Because incumbency, anybody on the call who studied game theory, uh, repeated games, um, are better for a player because they allow you to spread your risk um, than a once off uh, than than being in a game once off. And the five members of the Security Council, uh, because they are there every day, all day, they build relationships with the Secretariat. They have institutional memory. They make deals with each other over decades, even if in the actual uh, televised meetings, they will be very acrimonious. Uh, but there's all sorts of deals and um, negotiating that's happened behind the scenes over a long time uh, that then informs the decisions that they're making on a particular issue. And so for a country like South Africa that serves in the council as an elected member for two years uh, at a time, um, there is a lot that the elected members don't actually know about what's going on behind the scenes and they have a very short amount of time to be caught up. And so part of the reform of uh, the Security Council is around shifting those power dynamics and making the Security Council reflect the distribution of global power in 2021, uh, 75, about to be 76 years um, after the UN uh, was formed. And so talking then about South Africa's achievements, I think that South Africa, so South Africa served on the Security Council in 2007 and 2008, 2011 and 2012, and then in 2019 and 2020. And that a rapid succession of terms, I think, has allowed South Africa to build up an institutional memory um, and a, a sophistication, I think, in, in making decisions um, that other elected members, certainly from the African continent, have not had the opportunity to have. And so what that's allowed for is for South Africa to continue with a kind of um, an extension of its agenda over time. So uh, in one of the big achievements uh, for South Africa has been making the UN Security Council's work closer to the work of the AU Peace and Security Council. So there are now annual meetings that take place between the UN Security Council and the African Union. Um, and they alternate. Some years they're in New York, other years they are in Addis Ababa. Um, this year they've been online. Um, well, in the past in the past year they've been online. But these meetings mean that there is greater consultation and involvement of African states in the decisions of the Security Council about African issues, uh, which is really. Um, which has been hugely helpful and is something that the whole African continent has really galvanized around. The second success that I want to mention uh, that South Africa has had is around issues of women, peace and security, particularly I think in this period, in this last term, um, when at the, the presidency of, of Donald Trump, the United States was quite hostile to issues around women, peace and security, especially to do with reproductive health um, and, and sexual violence. And, and South Africa drove a process in 2019 that led to a resolution 2493 to commemorate uh, the 20 years of the women, peace and security agenda at the United Nations, uh, but also to really get commitment from all UN Security Council members states to the full fulfillment or full implementation uh, of, of, of that agenda. And I think that that was a huge um, victory uh, for South Africa. And then the final thing I want to mention is that particularly in the past two years, uh, South Africa with countries such as Germany, um, who also served at the Security Council at the same time, uh, managed to uh, achieve far greater cooperation between the elected 10 members of the Security Council, who were then almost able to balance 
out uh, the interests uh, of the permanent members and to work as a bloc. And particularly the three African members of the Security Council really cooperated with each other and worked as a bloc to be able to push uh, the interests uh, of the African continent, but to also balance out or try to balance out uh, the power of the permanent five members. But of course, as I've said, you know, because you don't have incumbency on your side as an elected member, you can push for those reforms for two years, but you have no guarantee that they're going to be carried forward uh, beyond that time. And given, I just want to end with this, you know, the formation of the League of Nations, the formation of the United Nations, all happened after world wars. Uh, the first, after the first world war, you had the League of Nations. After the second world war, you had the United Nations. And so these big life changing, uh, world changing events lead to massive changes in multilateralism and in the way that we engage with each other uh, on the world stage. And one hopes that COVID-19 is that kind of rupture uh, that will force uh, the kind of changes that have been called for uh, for for many decades uh, by African states, but also other states in the global south. Well, that also sounded like uh, if there was limited expansion of permanent members, you seem to have made a motivation that South Africa should be should benefit from one of those seats <laughs> on behalf of the continent. Uh, but that's a comment, not a question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bongeka is a question for the minister. In what ways can students or alumni with a background in international relations and a foreign language get involved with DECO? Uh, well, annually, uh, DECO uh, offers uh, internships uh, for, for young graduates and takes on a number of young graduates for a minimum of uh, two years uh, into a program within the department. Uh, unfortunately, we have had to cut down the numbers given the budgetary constraints that confront government at present. But I think the international experience is not just needed uh, in Durko. I think it applies in environment, uh, fisheries and forestry. I also think it applies uh, in the trade and industry uh, uh, domain uh, and several others, uh, defense, uh, state security and so on. And all of these uh, government departments do have uh, internship opportunities because this is a national program of government. You have the African peer review mechanism located within the Department of Public Service and Administration. So what young people should do is really Google, uh, uh, visit the uh, uh, department's websites, get to know more about, uh, uh, you know, these intakes uh, uh, of, of young, of, of interns and, and make use of those opportunities. Finally, um, the education system is introducing international languages more and more. And so uh, uh, young graduates should not neglect uh, the idea of teaching uh, uh, international or foreign languages in the South African education system, uh, because part of our engagement with the rest of the world is the ability to parler français and uh, other uh, uh, languages. So I think it's very important uh, that we don't see international training as preparing us for DERCO. There'd be far too many of us there um, even the tourism sector, I've often found uh, when I walk into uh, a store that uh, there's a tourist who is struggling uh, to make themselves understood because there isn't a foreign language speaker employed in the facility, even some hotels. Uh, so it's a broad range of opportunities uh, that such graduates could have access to. Yeah. So I'd like to ask both of you is the... Uh, uh, Perhaps a difficult question. What, uh, what, uh, if you like, difficulties the South African diplomacy faced in relating to fellow African countries and nations? Shall I kick off? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, I, I think from from my my, my uh, understanding or experience. Uh, a large part of the problem is we have a very, very different constitutional makeup uh, from mm -hmm. a, a large part of the continent. 
And we tend to approach issues on the basis of the framework uh, that is ours uh, and don't understand uh, that other countries don't operate on the same basis. So, you know, you would have, uh, for example, us dealing with one matter, um, a business person detained in a country, no charges for two weeks, uh, and then released suddenly and, and not sure what, what was actually going on. That would not happen in South Africa. Now, when you try and raise this, uh, uh, you know, you're sort of told all sorts of weird things about, oh, you know, tax wasn't paid or what. But, you know, you say, no, but you can't keep somebody, you know, for two weeks and uh, uh, they don't have access to the mission and so on. So I think, first, the constitutional framework is very different and South Africans think everybody is the same. And so even our analysts, when they analyze our interaction with the continent, they say, oh, Minister Pando is very mild with Zimbabwe, you know, as though Zimbabwe is a sort of semi-state of South Africa, you know, a province uh, of South it's Africa. Gen- it's a country, you know, itself. So you, you get that sort of thing. Uh, uh, why are you not commenting on Uganda? You know, why don't you tell Museveni uh, uh, what you should do, etc.? So we, we imagine um, that South Africa is very big and can tell people, you know, where to get off. We love our country, uh, uh, but uh, there are bigger countries. Uh, there are relations uh, that we need to obtain and sustain. Uh, and there is a mode of persuasion uh, that we may have to engage in. And thus you have to keep the door open. Uh, to ensure that you can persuade and arrive at difference. So I found that uh, uh, the difficulty is the expectation uh, that everybody understands issues and approaches them the way we do. Mm, okay. Analyst, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> I think certainly the the fact that South Africa was um, one of the last countries in Africa to gain independence um, in terms of, uh, you know, gaining um, uh, freedom from apartheid and, 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 and transforming into a democracy in 1994. I think that certainly does mean that while South Africans think that we are very important and, you know, senior uh, members of the African continent, uh, South Africa is considered in many places as one of the junior um, players uh, on the continent and uh, and South African um, officials and diplomats are treated in that way in engagements. I think the second thing, just to pick up on something that the minister had said, is that South Africa, because of the many years of isolation, but I think even after 1994, is very insular. So South Africans have very little understanding of how life is in other African countries. And indeed, if you speak to people about where they're going on holiday, people will go to Thailand when we could still go on holiday. People would go to Thailand or to Europe or to the US. But you don't have many South Africans that travel the continent and that really get to know about what life is in the other 53 countries uh, that make up uh, the African continent. And so South Africans tend to know a lot less about other Africans than other Africans know about South Africa. And and I think that that places us um, at, at a disadvantage. It means that a lot of our interaction with the continent can actually come across as very clumsy. And then um, the final thing is that I think that uh, while we must also think of the other 54 countries on the continent, we must forget that there are many other countries that are interested in Africa in African resources, um, in being able to influence what happens on the African continent. And so South Africa then competes strategically, not just with Nigeria or Ethiopia or Kenya or Rwanda, but it also competes with the United Arab Emirates and Israel and China and India and Brazil and Turkey and the United States and Great Britain and, and France, etc. And so and Russia. And so 
there are so many competing interests um, in the African continent. And I think that uh, certainly the South African public sometimes overstates or overestimates uh, what South Africa can do um, in continental relations. And I think that, um, you know, something that we should really be encouraging is for South Africans to get to know more about um, the rest of the continent, read Ethiopian literature, listen to um, Kenyan music. Uh, well, we all watch Nigerian films, which is great. Um, but I think that we need to have a lot more of that kind of knowledge sharing and cultural interaction uh, for us to really understand uh, this continent that we're just at the tip of. Uh, we're a very tiny part um, of Africa. So it's also still in, in, in that vein, it's still interesting that people will say those who go on holiday or in business or to other countries on our continent, they say they are going to Africa, which begs the question, where are they coming from? <laughs> 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 so I often say to people, well, you have not left the continent, so just tell me where you are going. <laughs> so, anyway, so the, the stuff you said now about um, culture and all of that well, actually was, was led me into my next question. Has South Africa sufficiently used this economic and cultural diplomacy, this soft power kind of uh, stuff for culture? Because also there are people who like South African music, South African soapies, GSTV penetrated the continent and all of that. I agree, of course, I mean, you still have to compete with Hollywood and, and in the French African countries with also stuff coming from French television. But if we used our cultural soft power enough to become acceptable or to become closer and cooperate more with other African countries. Um, I, I think uh, we, we did so in the uh, inception of democracy. Uh, uh, we certainly had many uh, South African uh, artists out there, and also uh, our interest in cultural institutions was uh, much stronger as the, per the work we did with the Timbuktu manuscripts, for example, uh, and the role we played uh, uh, in uh, their recovery and uh, in ensuring that they were restored. So um, uh, there was a much stronger use of cultural diplomacy. The recent uh, review that was initiated by the former minister, Minister Lindy Wesisulu, uh, highlighted in its report that they had noticed a significant decline in cultural diplomacy uh, uh, by uh, South African uh, policy practitioners. And so it is something uh, that I've asked the department to give attention to. But I think as we deliberate on these matters, uh, always at the back of my mind are the constant cuts uh, that my government is confronted, my department and our government indeed are confronted uh, with, um, and thus an inability to make real on some of the opportunities. Um, I've found some uh, missions have even stopped celebrating Freedom Day in order to save money. And I've said, no, we can't do that. You must, at least, even if it's a small celebration, uh, do something and showcase uh, South African art and culture in some way during such events. Uh, but uh, certainly the financial milieu has made life uh, very, very difficult. I think there's a better presence of uh, South African uh, films uh, and certainly books uh, in the international community, uh, uh, many of our writers, are enjoying greater prominence. And of course, UP would know uh, through Vice Chancellor that our scientists are doing extremely well. Uh, they're really placing us uh, on the global stage. I've had uh, comments uh, from foreign ministers uh, admiring the fact that it was South African scientists who realized and discovered this variant uh, of uh, the COVID-19 in South Africa. And they're saying, gosh, we didn't know you had such capacity uh, in your country. You know, we really would like to work with your scientists. So uh, there are attributes um, that we haven't really shared with the world uh, as much as, as we should. Um, in the paleontology field, we are world renowned. Uh, but I think South Africans don't recognize that that field and discipline is one that ranks us among the best globally because we don't make much of it in the country. 
So there are, you know, corrections uh, we need to make of communication, uh, of interfacing uh, with the broader South African public. And I think uh, uh, certainly a, a, a virtual such as this one is part of that correction in communication. Because South Africans uh, have tended to be really good at recognizing the negative and really bad at seeing the positive. And we have to shift that uh, in order to have a changed discourse about who we are and what we can do uh, with our attributes. So in relation to the African Union, so the African Union was actually born in Deben. I still remember those days when it was being transformed from the old a OAU. I love the OAU, but by the time the AU in 2002 came into being. I did wish the OAU must go away now because it was no longer serving the papers that it did. Remember, but I, I, I appreciate the OAU because I was born the same year as the AU, the OAU, and it led the liberation struggles of our continent. But what can South Africa say? Can South Africa say that it has further shaped the AU? to be fit for papers for a 21st century Africa? Or what is its influence in those in that domain? Stembile, Dr. Stembile. Look, I think that uh, the AU was formed in order to get over the old boys club that the OAU uh, became. And uh, I'm afraid that in many ways, the AU has become another old boys club um, that is really not as inclusive of young people, of women, as it should be um, in order to take uh, the African continent uh, into the future. So while there are these plans like Agenda 2063 um, and all sorts of great uh, plans, I just don't think that the AU is really fit for purpose and is doing what it was envisioned to do, uh, which is to aid in African cooperation, um, but also um, in African uh, development. We have seen the African Free Trade Agreement be signed and coming into uh, effect in January, and hopefully um, that will, you know, assist uh, development on, on the continent. But I must say that uh, as somebody who was uh, 17 or 18 when the AU uh, was formed, um, it has been a real disappointment, actually, uh, for, for young people on the continent. I think... Uh, probably, you know, two years ago, I might have agreed partially with Dr. Mbete, but I, I fundamentally disagree because I've got <laughs> to see in detail the work that the African Union does. And it's not working in the easiest of environments. You can't separate institutions from context. And Africa <laughs> is not the easiest of context. I, for example, uh, was very pleased that uh, at the summit we held in February this year, 85% of the members of the African Union had paid their dues to the organization. And I thought, my goodness, this is really something. Um, and also uh, talking of South Africa, the insertion of gender equality into the structures of the AU formally has been part of the mandate South Africa had been articulating along with many other women. Uh, we shouldn't render women uh, disempowered by some of what we say, we have a requirement of 50% in the commission, 50% women, 50% male. That requirement is being observed and is being achieved. And I've been really impressed by some of the uh, women commissioners and the work that they're doing. For example, on COVID-19, the Commissioner on Social Matters was incredible, working with the heads of state and with ministers of health and finance. So don't undermine ourselves. This is my problem. This thing <laughs> of the negative. I'm not saying lie because I don't like lies, but I am saying where good is being done, appreciate it. We have a very active infrastructure initiative that we are pursuing as members of the African Union. And country by country, you're seeing the change take place. Go and see the roads in Ghana now. Just look at what they're planning with respect to the rail infrastructure refurbishment. Go and see the port that has been built in Equatorial Guinea. Go and see what Togo is doing. 
So don't just look at the negative. It's not the best organization. We're not happy with some of the financial management. There are administrative failings, absolutely. But utter failure, no. Able <laughs> to be transformed, yes. We must work at it and we must achieve those changes. Remember where we come from. And I think to change the continent will take energy, it will take durable people, and it will take commitment. We are the only ones who can have and are responsible for building our institutions. Nobody can do it for us. I'm thrilled at what President Ramaphosa achieved as chair uh, in a very short time in a difficult year. The fact that we said to African leaders, and I was just saying this to His Excellency the other day, uh, that we said to African countries, as South Africa, we believe the Center for Disease Control must play a critical role in providing support to Africa as we respond to COVID-19. To allow it to do so, South Africa is going to make a voluntary contribution to it. One by one, the heads of state said, we will match South Africa's contribution. And guess what? Those funds are beginning to reach the African CDC. And it will have a strong, because we must have a strong African Centers for Disease Control. But it takes us to do it, nobody else. And if we sort of say, oh, you know, these guys, are, they're so corrupt, they're, it won't happen. But if we say, look, we expect you to do the following, we want to attract talent. We've got uh, Dr. Nkenga Song, he's playing a fantastic role. Let's give him all the backup. Let's make sure he's got the human capability. He's got the funding for the research. The data center is up to date. Let's help because then you build up. But otherwise, the no, so I'm not uh, uh, in any way excusing the failings. I'm worried about some of the uh, irregular expenditure I see. I will continue to fight on that, but I don't think it's a useless organization. Yeah. Mbide, now, having said that, I, won't you run for the AU commissioner or in the future in, in order uh, partly to address the weak cases and take it to the next level? I would be delighted. I would be delighted to. I certainly, I certainly would do so. Um, and I am uh, pleased and excited to hear what the minister's response was uh, to my comments. And it is good to to know uh, that there are and there are such um, such developments. I do think that under uh, President Ramaphosa last year, uh, the AU's response with the Africa CDC to COVID nineteen for the interests of the whole continent, I think was really uh, well managed. Yeah. On that positive note, I think you notes know, because the minister ended on a positive note, and so have you now. We'll end our conversation. I'm really delighted. This was really enriching, and I hope enriching to our alumni too. I'm, I'm tempted to have you back because there are questions <laughs> I didn't ask. For example, do you think this guy Biden is really going to be any different fundamentally? You know, so for part two, we shall have part two. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, much everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. I know how Thank busy you. you are. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to everyone at home who listened. Thank you very much. Next one is coming soon. Thank you. There are some places that will always be home. From the moment you took your first step onto the University of Pretoria's campuses, you've been part of our family. You've made friends, had a good time, fallen in and out of love, passed tests, failed some dismally, and started businesses. You had some great ideas. All the while, you made memories and learnt a lot. But in the end, you walked out of our gates a well-rounded person, someone committed to excellence, you still get things done the right way the first time. You've learned the value of innovation, mentoring, having a positive impact, and living a life based on strong morals, ethics, hard work, and responsibility. At the University of Pretoria, we're proud to call you part of our family. We're proud to be your alma mater, and we'd be delighted if you wanted to choose UP again to further your studies. Because even though we're the largest residential research university in South Africa, we're still your home. One thing we've learned over more than a century 
is that excellence is forever. We're still adamant in the high quality of our teaching and learning and in the graduates that we produce. The more things change, the more they stay the same. UP will always be the home of Tux alumni.